Hey guys, so today I wanted to go ahead and do a little book haul for you. It's going for this first part, I believe I have six books and let's get started. So the first book that I got was James Baldwin's Go Tell It on the Mountain. And I'm just going to go ahead and read you the back just because I feel that the back can convey a little bit more. Mountain, James Baldwin said, is the book that I had to write if I was ever going to write anything else. Baldwin's first major work, Go Tell It on the Mountain, has established itself as an American classic with lyrical precision, psychological directiveness, resonating symbolic power, and a rage that is at once unrelenting and compassionate. Baldwin chronicles a 14-year-old boy's discovery one Saturday in March 1935 of the terms of his identity as the stepson of the minister of a storefront Pentecostal church in Harlem. Baldwin's rendering of this protagonist's spiritual, sexual, and moral struggle of self-invention opened new possibilities in the American language and in the way Americans understand themselves. Just to give you a taste for the writing, I'm going to read like the first paragraph of the book. Part one, the seventh day. Everyone had always said that John would have been a preacher when he grew up, just like his father. It had been said so often that John, without ever thinking about it, had come to believe it himself. Not until the morning of his 14th birthday did he really begin to think about it. And by then, it was already too late. Then we have M Train by Patti Smith. M Train begins in a tiny Greenwich Village cafe where Smith goes every morning for black coffee, ruminates on the world as it is and the world as it was, and writes in her notebook. Through prose that shifts fluidly between dreams and reality, past and present, and across a landscape with creative aspirations and inspirations, we travel to Frida Kahlo's Casa de Azul in Mexico to a meeting of an architect's explorer society in Berlin, to a ramshackle seaside bungalow in New York's far Rockaway that Smith acquires just before Hurricane Sally hits, into the graves of Jeanette Plath, Rimbaud, and Mishima. Woven throughout are reflections on the writer's craft and artistic creation. Here, too, are singular memories of Smith's life in Michigan and the irredeemable loss of her husband, Fred Sonic Smith. It's not so easy writing about nothing. That's what a cowpoke was saying as I entered the frame of a dream. Vaguely handsome, intensely laconic, he was balancing on a folding chair, leaning backwards, his Stetson brushing the edge of the dun-colored exterior of a lone cafe. I say lone, as there appeared to be nothing else around except for an antiquated gas pump and a rusting broth ornamented with the necklace of horseflies slung above the last dredge of its stagnant water. There was no one around either, but he didn't seem to mind. He just pulled the brim of his hat over his eyes and kept on talking. It was the same kind of silver belly open road model that Lyndon Johnson used to wear. Then I got Salvage the Bones by Jasmine Ward. They heard it on the radio. A hurricane is coming threatening the town of Bois Sauvage, Mississippi. Esha's hard-drinking father can feel it in his bone. Esha and her brothers are trying to prepare, but there are other worries too. Shita is watching his prized pit bull, helpless as her new litter dies one by one. Randall, when not preoccupied with baseball, is busy looking after the youngest, Junior. And Esh, 15 and motherless among men, has just realized that she's pregnant. The children of, the, of this family have always been short on nurture, but they are fiercely loyal to one another. It is together that they will face the building storm and the day that will dawn after. The first day, birth in a bare, bold place. China's turned on herself. If I didn't know, I would think she was trying to eat her paws. I would think that she was crazy, which she is, in a way. Won't let nobody touch her but Skeet. When she was a big-headed pit bull puppy, she stole all the shoes in the house, all our black tennis shoes Mama bought because they hid dirt and hold up until they're beaten soft. Only Mama's forgotten sandals, thin-heeled and tinted pink with much red 
mud seeped into them looked different. China hid them all under furniture, behind the toilet, stacked them in piles, and slept on them. When the dog was old enough to run and trip down the steps on her own, she took the shoes outside, put them in shallow ditches under the house. She'd stand rigid as a pine when we tried to take them from her. Now China is given like she once took away, bestowing where she once stole. She is birthing puppies. And it looks like someone annotated it in this one because it was a used copy. So I'm always really curious to see what people have written and thought. So that will be exciting. My next one is Reason She Goes Into the Woods by Deborah K. Davis. Yeah, K. Davis. And this one I believe I heard about on Mercedes Bookish Musings channel. Um, and I'll go ahead and link that in the description. Pearl can be very, very good. More often, though, she is very, very bad. But she is just a child, a mystery to all who know her, a little girl who has her own secret reasons for escaping to the nearby woods. What might those reasons be? And how can she feel so at home in the dark, sinister, sensual woods, a wonder of, of secrets and mysteries? And now to the first chapter, I mean the first paragraph. And it's subtitled or titled, Pearl and her father because I believe this is like a series of vignettes because there's like one per page and they all have like a name and then you have the vignette so the first one is Pearl and her father Pearl is perched astride her father's knee rain taps the front of the window and she can just make out all along the wavering hedge wet purple flowers that look just like miniature bunches of grapes here in the lounge the lamplight reaches out to rest on the carpet ridges and the stiff pleats bordering the cushions. She and her father are in a hideaway. He sits on the yellow and blue settee. She sits on him. It's wonderful, but it makes her stomach growl every time she's with him. She plays with his sleep soft hands, placing them on her cheeks. When she lets go, they flop back onto his lap and she lifts them again. His lips are parted and she can see a wink of teeth. His eyes are closed, his breathing rhythmic and deep. She brings her face up close so that the room is filled with her father's regular heartbreaking features. So that is that. I shan't read to you the whole page because it's more than a paragraph. Then we have another one that I've heard a lot on book two. I'm not sure whose channel I heard about it first from. But it's My Year of Meats by Ruth L. Ozeki. Jane Tagai Little, by trade a documentary filmmaker, by nature a truth seeker, is racially half Japanese and American, and, as she tells us, neither here nor there. Jane is sharp-edged, desperate for a job, and determined not to fall in love again. Akiko Uno, a Japanese housewife, lives with her husband in a bleak high-rise apartment complex in a suburb of Tokyo. At night, she lies awake, silently turning the pages of the pillow book, marveling at Se Shunogan's deft, sure prose. Akiko is so thin, her bones hurt, and her husband, an ad agency salaryman who wants her to get pregnant, is insisting that she put some meat on them, literally. Ruth L. Oizeki's exuberant, shocking, mesmerizing novel opens with Two women on opposite sides of the globe whose lives cannot be further apart. But when Jane gets a job coordinating a television series whose mission is to bring the American heartland and American meat into the homes of Japan, she makes some wrenching discoveries about love, meat, honor, and a hormone called DES. When Jane and Akiko's lives converge, what is revealed taps the deepest concerns of our time how the past informs the present, and how we live and love in this blessed, ever-shrinking world. Prologue. The American wife sits on the floor in front of the fireplace. The flickering light from an electric Yule log, left there all year round, plays across the sweaty sheen of her large, pale face. Legs tucked, toes curling nervously in a brand new pink shag rug from Walmart. She is leaning forward on one arm, perfectly still. Her lips are pursed. Her husband faces her, his mouth drawn taunt, ready, inches from hers. 
they wait. Then we have the this uh, Penguin Drop Cloth Edition classic, modern classic I believe, um, called Native Speaker and it's by Zhang Ra Li. Korean American Henry Park is surreptitious B plus student of life. Illegal alien, emotional alien, yellow peril, neo-American, stranger, follower, traitor, spy. Or so says his wife in the list she writes upon leaving him. Henry is forever uncertain of his place, a perpetual outsider looking at American culture from a distance. And now, a man of two worlds, he is beginning to fear that he has betrayed both and belongs to neither. The date my wife left me, she gave me a list of who I was. I don't know what she was handing me. She had been compiling it without my knowledge for the last year or so we were together. Eventually, I would understand that she didn't mean the list as exhaustive, something complete, in any way, the sum of my character or nature. Leila was the last person who would attempt anything vaguely encyclopedic. But then maybe she herself didn't know what she was doing. She was drawing up idioms in the list, visions of me in the whitest, raw light, instant snapshots of truths native to our time together. That was my bacall. I know bacalls can be really kind of vague and not pointless, but it's kind of, I don't know, they're not as interesting to me as book reviews. So I hope you enjoyed it anyway, and I hope to speak with you in the comments. If any of those books interest you, please just tell me in the comments and we can talk about it. And I'm also, just so you guys know, for the next video, working on a book review of A Brief History of Seven Killings by Marlon James. Um, I'm putting some time into it, so I think that'll be a really cool video, hopefully. Um, been researching it a lot because it's such an interesting book with so much to to say and so much wealth and it's just a really good book it's my favorite read of, of obviously this year so far but probably last year as well if I were to count last year at this point so I'm hoping to get that done soon and anyway have a lovely day